Hello, I'm Anna Zemke from University of Pittsburgh, here to present data from our research group on Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, and chronic rhinositis and cystic fibrosis. I have no financial interest to disclose for this presentation. Chronic rhinositis and cystic fibrosis is very common. So at least 95% of people with CF have sinus mucosal thickening on their CT scans. And somewhere between 30 and 60% of people with CF report symptoms of sinus disease. The pathophysiology of CF sinus disease is pretty similar to that of CF airway disease, where thickened mucus is chronically infected and there's cycles of ongoing infection and inflammation leading to tissue remodeling. And as a reminder, sinus disease persists after lung transplant, and many people post-lung transplant are symptomatic from their sinus disease. CRS has multiple impacts for the health and well-being of individuals with CF. First of all, there's ongoing symptoms such as facial pain, headaches, anterior and posterior nasal drainage, loss of olfaction or the ability to smell. There's a treatment burden with surgeries, often repeated surgeries, medical appointments with otolaryngology, and medications like sinus rinses with antibiotics or steroids in them. Sinus health and lung health are probably pretty tightly linked. Um, pulmonary and sinus CF exacerbations are temporally linked. And during pulmonary exacerbations, individuals with CF report worse sinonasal quality of life. Finally, the sinuses may be an initial site of infection for the respiratory tract and also can provide a bacterial reservoir that seeds lung allografts after transplant. This leads to our study question, which is how does Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor affect the clinical manifestations of CF sinus disease? So we did a prospective observational cohort study and the study was done at University of Pittsburgh and also University of North Carolina. Participants had two study visits. The first study visit happened before starting treatment. And the second visit was supposed to be at six months, but it actually ended up being closer to nine months because of COVID. So after six to 12 months of therapy. At the study visits, participants had a rigid sinonasal endoscopy. They got a low-dose radiation CT scan sweat chloride measurement, spirometry, and BMI. They completed an olfaction test called the UPSIT and had a microbiome swab collected. Participants also reported their sinonasal quality of life on a symptom scale called the SNOT-22 that was administered remotely prior to treatment and then on day 7, 28, 56, um, 120, and 180. The primary endpoint for the study was symptom change as measured by the Sinonasa Up Test 22. And our secondary endpoints were endoscopic improvement measured on the Lung Kennedy scale, CT radiographic improvement measured on the Lung McKay scale, olfaction measured with an upset test, and the change in the sinonasal microbiome. I won't be presenting the microbiome data today because it's still being analyzed. So to measure symptoms, we use the Sinonasal Outcome Test 22 item, which is a quality of life instrument um, that can be administered remotely. It's been widely used in cystic fibrosis, as well as other causes of CRS in multiple languages. And it has subscales that cover various sinonasal symptoms, for example, plugged nose, um, nasal drainage, facial pain, and as well as subscales regarding sleep and productivity and mood. Our cohort consisted of 34 people, slightly over half were male. The median age was 27 years with a range of 12 to 60. Now of note, a full third of this cohort were actually teenagers between the ages of 12 and 20. A little more than half were homozygous for 508 Dell and slightly over half had been on modulators prior to the study. The visit interval was a median of nine months with a range of six to 12 months. So what did we find? First, we saw a really dramatic improvement in sinonasal symptom burden within a week of starting treatment. 
In this graph on the left, study day is along the x-axis and severity of symptoms is along the y with higher scores, meaning more symptoms. And there was a drop in symptom severity within seven days that plateaued by about a month and persisted out to six months. We saw improvement across all symptom subscales and the minimally clinically important difference for this scale is about nine points. And we saw a greater than nine point improvement in symptoms with treatment. So what predicted symptomatic improvement? Of the covariates we tested, the only one that actually predicted symptomatic improvement was the Lynn McKay score. So people with greater or worse radiographic disease at baseline had a greater improvement in symptoms on therapy. The other covariates we looked at, there was no relationship. Um, the study may be underpowered to detect small differences, uh, but the dramatic difference we saw was with an association with the radiographic severity. Next, participants underwent a rigid endoscopy by a skilled rhinologist. Um, for the most part, Drs. Kimple and Stapleton did most of our endoscopies for the study. The endoscopies were recorded and scored using the Len Kennedy scale. And what we saw was also pretty dramatic. So the Lynn Kennedy scale has five items, um, one of which is crusting. And here is crusting that's entirely resolved with treatment. So on the left, you can see a crust here that had, um, it's kind of yellow green. And in the follow-up picture, the mucosa is less edematous, less erythematous, and the crusting is entirely resolved in all participants on our scale. Now, of note, these participants had no sinal nasal surgeries or other procedures in between the two visits. And actually most of them had less contact with the healthcare system than usual because this was right in the middle of the COVID shutdowns. We also saw an improvement in polyps. So here's a large polyp partially occluding this nasal passage before treatment that's resolved after treatment. Um, quantitatively, we saw an improvement in polyps with treatment. Uh, on, on the endoscopy scales. And our endoscopists noticed that um, after treatment, there were these residual little areas um, that were described as being deflated or shrunken or looking like, quote, raisins, um, much smaller um, areas where you can still see real residual polypoid-like tissue notated by these black arrows. These are all um, endoscopy pictures on treatment for the sake of simplicity of presentation. The pre-treatment photos all show a nasal passage that's largely occluded by a combination of polyps and discharge. So there are still residual areas of epithelial abnormality on treatment. In terms of what predicts improvement with treatment, Again, greater radiographic disease burden, it's measured on the Lemma K scale at baseline, was associated with a greater improvement in endoscopy scores on therapy. To the left is a coefficient plot showing um, coefficients with 95% confidence intervals. Finally, the CT scan results. We did low dose dedicated sinonasal CT scans for all participants, and the scans were scored by an experienced neuroradiologist using the modified Len McKay scale. The radiologist was blinded to treatment status. And again, we saw an improvement in sinus opacification on CT scan and mucosal thickening. So here's a representative image uh, where you can see a nasal passage that's largely occluded um, by mucus and mucosal thickening. And on follow-up, the ethmoid and maxillary sinuses here are now nicely aerated and the Len McKay score had improved from 15 down to 12 points, which is statistically significant. Additional results worth noting. So we didn't see improvement in endoscopic scarring, which makes sense because many of these sinonasal passages um, we're from people that lived with CF for up to 60 years. Um, so it makes sense that some scarring might not be reversible with six months of treatment in an adult. Olfaction didn't improve. And I'd refer listeners to the publication by Bacon et al. for further discussion of this. 
we saw a small number of people that didn't have objective improvement on treatment, meaning improvement in either CT scan or endoscopy. And these individuals had very similar sweat chloride changes to the rest of the cohort. Um, so they had a biochemical response to treatment and some of them had a symptomatic response as well, um, but not necessarily improvement on endoscopy or CT scan. We don't know why this is. Um, it implies that there's additional disease mo modifiers other than just CFTR function in some individuals with chronic rhinitis and CF. Um, but at this point, we don't, we don't have scientific data to explain this. Finally, higher sweat chloride prior to treatment predicted worse CT and endoscopy scores at baseline, but did not predict symptom severity. This is in, agree in agreement with a body of literature where people have generally tried to group um, cohorts by CFTR mutation classes and then associate the classes with some measure of CRS severity. And in general, um, class one, two, three mutations are associated with more radiographic or endoscopic disease, but not necessarily more symptomatic disease. Um, and we saw something similar, but this time with direct sweat chloride measurements. In summary, ETI improves symptoms of sinonasal disease within seven days of therapy, and the improvement persists at to at least six months. Radiographic findings the CRS improved with treatment in most individuals. Endoscopy findings improve, particularly crusting and polyposis. And I'd like to thank many people who assisted with the studies. First of all, the individuals and families with CF who participated in the study despite COVID. And I would like to thank our excellent research teams at Pittsburgh and University of North Carolina. And the study was funded primarily by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. We thank them for funding. Hello, my name is Julian Tam, and I'm the clinic director of the Adult CF Clinic in Saskatoon, Canada. The following relationships exist related to this presentation. I've received an honorarium from Vertex for participating in an educational event. I've received a research grant from AstraZeneca. My co-chair, Marty Solomon from the University of Alabama, and I would like to welcome you to our workshop, Update on Modulators. Our workshop will consist of five presentations followed each by a discussion period. It's been 10 years since the landmark trial on Ivacaptor in people with CF and the G551D gene mutation was published. During the subsequent years, our CF community has gained access to additional modulators that can improve outcomes for an increasing proportion of people with CF. With the development of the highly effective CFTR modulator, Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor, we're now at the point at which approximately 90% of people with CF can be treated with modulator therapy. As Dr. Solomon and I prepared for this workshop, several key themes emerged that became our educational objectives. Our speakers will be presenting work that span the clinical and basic science research domains. Their presentations will advance our understanding of CFTR modulators and inspire new questions. First, what are the effects of highly effective modulator therapies on health outcomes? We will hear from Anna Zemke regarding the effects of ETI on chronic rhinosinusitis in CF. Vijanathan Ganapathy will be describing data on the real world clinical effectiveness of ETI. Next, what are the mechanisms of action of CFTR modulators beyond ion transport? Anthony Fisher will be presenting findings from his registry-based study on CFTR modulators and new bacterial acquisition. Benjamin Kopp will be describing the effects of ETI on CF macrophage function. Finally, how can CFTR modulators affect future research methodology? We will hear from Grace Cho about the effect of highly effective modulators on lung function decline prediction using the US CF registry. Thank you very much. 
and we look forward to an exciting session. So thanks, Anna. We're, we're going to start with the Q&A now, and Julian's going to lead us off. He's been keeping a list of questions since he's practicing for when I when I exit here in a few moments. So we'll lead off with the questions he's been preparing as a list uh, for Anna, and thanks for a great presentation. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Marty and Anna, and thank you, everyone, for joining our workshop today. Um, Dr. Zemke, would you be able to please comment on which mechanistic basis you feel is most operative, whether it's via in improved mucociliary clearance, change in antibacterial factors? How? Uh, what are your thoughts? So the short answer is I don't know. The longer answer is I think a lot of this is going to end up being improvements in epithelial function and inflammation. There's probably gonna be changes in the microbiome. That data is in meta-analysis. Um, yesterday, I went to a fascinating talk by um, Dr. Lauder at the innate immunity session where they have a, a second cohort from this um, doing RNA-seq, looking at non-responders and responders. And in the non-responders, they see a different inflammatory phenotype. So ongoing neutrophilic inflammation um, though I would listen to her as primary source on that. So I suspect it's mostly going to be epithelial and inflammation, at least in this acute phase. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have another question about whether genotype or prior modulator use had an impact on outcomes. We didn't see any interactions with genotype or prior modulator use. A limitation is cohort size but we saw a pretty uniform improvement in about 90% of the cohort. Thank you. And would you also uh, please be able to comment on whether subjects in the study uh, remained on any sinus treatment regimens while on ETI? So presumably, yes. Um, the study participants, many of them had had prior interactions with otolaryngology clinic due to our recruitment process, but not all of them. Um, we didn't stop any study treatments as part of this study. Whether people stopped them themselves or tailed back on them as they were feeling better, we don't know. So they did continue rinses, um, about half the cohorts on nasal steroid rinses, and a smaller proportion are on antibiotic rinses, topical nasal rinses. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, and I also have a question to add to that. Um, do you have any thoughts on extending the duration of the um, study period in terms of seeing whether there are benefits that persist um, for an even longer time period? So I'm going to give a shout out to a separate group on this. Um, there's another ongoing study that's going to go out to two years. So they should have data out to two years. We've got a study that is instead going down in age. So we're enrolling um, kids that are now eligible for modulator therapy. So those data should be coming um, between the two groups. Thanks. Um, and I see that there is another question on whether um, you have any histology on the polyps for cell types present. No, and that's a fascinating question because you wonder, is this a problem with um, epithelial layer maintenance with like the stem cell population. What are these residual polyps made of? Um, presumably if you went off therapy, they'd swell back up, um, but we don't know that. So we don't have histology. I, having histology would be great. Presumptively that RNA-seq study you spoke of would look at cell type distribution based on, you know, you know gene expression and whatnot, because that would has been looked at for other epithelial function type studies before. So that may be able to get at that question, which I think is important. Yeah. I would defer to Dr. Beswick's and Vlader's groups on, group on that at this point. We don't have any histology on our end or, yeah. or um, transcriptional data. I am looking through the list of questions and I think that um, all of the questions have been addressed. Thank you very much again, Dr. Zemke for sharing your, oh, actually I literally see one new question pop up into the chat box, one moment. So the question was, um, how you will adopt 
or perhaps not adopt new CFTR modulators um, when one or more modulators become available? Um, would you um, offer it to um, uh, new patients only? And if there are switches, um, which uh, patients? So I'm going to defer that question to people that are primarily studying the effects of modulators in lung disease, because I think that's going to be the driving factor for the initiation of modulators in the vast majority of patients. Um, I think our data is applicable to initiating modulators potentially in um, either people with, with minimal lung disease that might otherwise not start, but that's going to be a very, very small population or in the post-transplant patients. Um, so I'll leave that for other people on this section to discuss some more. Very reasonable. Well, thank you very much again, Dr. Zemke, for sharing your work with us today. Um, in a few moments, we'll be moving on to Dr. Ganapathy's presentation, but I'd like to also remind the audience that you are welcome to submit questions via the question and answer uh, tab on the side of the um, display screen. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Vaidyanathan Ganapati. I'm a director for real world evidence at Vertex Pharmaceuticals. The topic for my presentation today is uh, interim results from the Helio study. Helio study is a real world effectiveness study of Alexacaftra, Tesacaftra, Ivacaftra, triple combination in people with cystic fibrosis. Here are my disclosures for transparency. To just to give a background, um, Alexa was shown to be safe and efficacious in pivotal clinical trials uh, in children with CF aged six years and above with at least one F508 del CFTR allele. Since the FDA approval of Alexa back in October 2019, there have been a few studies um, to date, uh, real world studies to date, but not large cohort studies in the real world effectiveness of Alexa The Helio study was initiated back in 2019, right after the approval, um, in order to evaluate the clinical effectiveness in a real world setting. And uh, this was basically among patients with CF 12 years of age and above who initiated treatment with Alexa and were not previously eligible for any of the CFDR modulator until FDA approval of Alexa This means that the study was restricted to some specific genotypes, which we'll be seeing in the method section. Um, in terms of the design and the interim analysis, Helio is a US-based multi-center prospective single arm study, and uh, it's an observational study designed to evaluate the real-world clinical effectiveness of Alexa in patients who met some inclusion and exclusion criteria, which you can see in the next slide. As I said, basically patients who are 12 years of age and above, they had specific genotypes um, in order to be in, in, in order to fulfill the criteria that they should not be eligible for another CFTR modulator prior to Trikafta's Alexa's approval. So these includes the FMF genotype, so F508 on one allele and minimal function mutation on the second allele, or an F uncharacterized genotype, so an F508 del in the first allele, and an uncharacterized uh, mutation that is not yet characterized as either F508, a minimal function mutation, a residual function mutation, or a gating mutation. Patients should have initiated um, treatment with Alexa as per their physician's prescription. And um, patients with only uh, pa patients with 12, 12 months or more of medical history data in the EMR were included uh, for the analysis just to understand the baseline characteristics before treating Alexa and also to calculate the pulmonary exacerbation event rates uh, in, the, in the previous 12 months. The exclusion criteria were pretty standard where patients were excluded if they were participating in interventional clinical studies or they had recent exposures to investigational Alexa-CAFTR or VX659 um, in, uh, in, in the period prior to initiating Alexa-Ziva. Back to the study design, um, the clinical characteristics and treatment information were digitally extracted from patient electronic medical records from 
12 month pre to up to 16 months after that Alex Tazaiva initiation. And the study is sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceuticals and the protocol has been approved by a Central Ethics Committee and institutional review boards of CF care centers as applicable. And in terms of the clinical endpoints for the study, there were three that were pre-specified, absolute change from baseline in PPFEB1, absolute change from baseline in body mass index and body mass index for HZ score for those pediatric patients between 12 and 20 years of age, and the pulmonary exacerbation event rates uh, and that were annualized. So calculated in the 12 month prior to initiating Alexa and in the post baseline period, uh, in the post baseline period up to the interim data extraction time point, and were for, and were and were analyzed um, subsequently. So this is a pre-planned interim analysis that included all patients with CF who had at least a six months of data available in their medical records. So the, a minimum of six months following initiate initiation of Alexa and a maximum of up to 16 months. Uh, um, as I said, the study does not have a comparator arm, so all analysis were descriptive. So including absolute changes from baseline and PPFEV1, um, nutritional statuses measured by BMI and BMI for age, Z-score. And these analysis were reported at six months and also um, and, and also for the period, the entire post-baseline period, through the entire post-baseline period, uh, up, up until the timing of the interim cutoff date. Um, so the baseline for BMI and PPFEV1 were defined as the most recent non-missing measurements. For, um, for, for the post-baseline values, uh, for, the, for, the, for the assessment of the, um, the change through the overall post alexa Post baseline period, we use the PPFU and BMI values that were available and averaged them before calculating a change from uh, the change from baseline. Pulmonary exacerbation events were defined based on the use of oral or intravenous antibiotic biotics or hospitalization that were associated with a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis or pulmonary exacerbations uh, due to cystic fibrosis. And uh, the event rate ratios were calculated using a negative binomial model. On to the results. So this table shows the demographic and baseline characteristics. Um, I also wanted to mention that the mean follow-up time for the study was 11.2 months. So the minimum was six months. The mean was 11.2 months. So almost close to almost close to a year. And um, these the, these demographic characteristics, characteristics are pretty much um, what you would see in the real world. And especially just wanted to highlight the PPFEV1 mean baseline was, was 71, reflecting that there is a range of patients from less than 40 to greater than or equal to 90. And especially there were about 22% uh, of patients who had a PPFEV1 greater than or equal to 90, the study. And most patients... Um, had an FMF genotype and about 12% uh, had about uh, had the FN characterized genotype. These are the results for change from baseline and PPFEV1. The change at six months included 52 patients and there was a 10.4 percentage point change from baseline in PPFEV1. The change through post Alexa period was, uh, had 73 observations and the change from baseline value was 9.5 percentage points, both indicating a positive impact on lung function and a clinically meaningful change from baseline. These results are for the BMI, a body mass index, and the change at six months included 67 patients, and the change from baseline value was 1.08 kilogram per meter squared, the change through post alexa period included 87 patients, and it the, the, the change from baseline in BMI through the post alexa period was about 0.96, so closer, closer to uh, one kilogram per meter squared. Again, these results indicate a clinically meaningful and positive impact of alexa on on BMI. Uh, 
And uh, these results are again for BMI, but BMI for age Z score, uh, the Z scores were calculated for the very young pediatric patients between 12 years of age and uh, 20 years of age. And um, the, the sample size accordingly reduced uh, because of the age restriction. And you can, and, and the wider confidence intervals are a result of the sample size. But you can still see that um, there is a positive impact uh, on, on BMI with um, the change at six months being 0.21 Z-score points and 0.15 um, um, standard deviations uh, through the post alexa period. And these was also for the annualized rates of pulmonary exacerbations. The event rates prior to initiating Alexstazaiba was uh, 1.24 annualized for the 12 months prior to initiating pre alexstazaiba and the event rate, the annualized event rate in the post alexstazaiba period was about 0.49. Now this corresponds to a 61% reduction in the annualized pulmonary exacerbation rate after initiating alexstazaiba. The study has the following limitations. The study is observational in nature um, and it's a single arm study. The results therefore should not be interpreted causally. Also the data collection for the study coincides with the, the, the pandemic and therefore the results may be subject to potential impact of the pandemic on missing observations and also confounding bias on some of the, stu some, on some of the study outcomes. Now, the, um, since some of this data was also collected during the pandemic uh, and given that this is a pre post design, we would expect that some of these effects would be similar in the pre and the post. Um, uh, post period, but but that was not that was not officially tested in the interim analysis. Once we have the final data set, we'll be doing more testing for the confounding of the pandemic and be able to address those. Um, to conclude the presentation, um, so Helio is a real world evidence study uh, of patients uh, of pa patients in the U.S. who have been exposed to Alexstazaiba, and in a real world setting among patients who are 12 years and above with the FMF or FN characterized genotypes who initiated Alexstazaiba, there were clinically meaningful improvements in lung function, nutritional status, and pulmonary exacerbation rates. The results from, from this interim analysis were generally consistent with the pivotal clinical trials of Alexstazaiba, and they support the clinical benefits of Alexstazaiba in a more heterogeneous real-world real population. For more information, you can come to the poster, poster number 56, where you can find some more additional details about the study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganapathy. We've got a, um, multiple questions from the audience. I actually see that my co-chair, Dr. Solomon has a question. Marty, would you like to go ahead? Sure, thanks very much uh, for a very good talk. And I, my question was uh, that, 10 or 12% of patients that had an uncharacterized second allele. Are any of those ones that have subsequently been approved for ETI with the label expansion using the FRT system or ones that were predicted to have a, a residual effect uh, because they were partial function mutations or whatnot? Just curious if those patients may have had different outcomes and if there can be additive effects in that particular patient <clears throat> population. Right. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for the question. And so the, uh, the uncharacterized mutations are actually, uh, you know, it's, it's a mixture of you know, those that, that have been approved, uh, you know, like uh, since the approval of the FNE and also certain mutations that are not um, responsive to Trikafta mm -hmm. and also certain mut and, and mutations that have not been identified, you know, so okay, it, it includes some mixture. Some are unknown. Got it. Exactly. Okay. Right. Got it. I, I was mostly asking that question because I was curious that this concept of additive effects for the for two alleles is, is interesting. Uh, for the non-homozygote patients. And I think we're learning more from, for instance, the Czech study that there can be additive effects for multiple alleles that have different modulator effects. And I'm just curious if you could answer that partially from this, but does it sound like that's the case? Thank yeah, you. And we, didn't, we didn't have enough, um, you know, the F other was only about 10 to 12% yeah. pers in the study. So yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I see a question from the audience who wanted to clarify whether um, the subjects in the study were modulator naive or if they had been on other modulators previously. So all 
the all the patients, all the subjects in the study are model eight and nine. So including the FMF who were, you know, eligible for trikafta for the first time, and the F FN characterized uh, mutations also were in the model eight and nine as well. Thanks. Um, and may I please ask um, whether your data indicates a time point at which um, certain patients may have their lung function either peak or plateau um, in a real world setting? Yeah, so this is um, you know, because the spirometries were based on what was recorded in the medical records, right? It was like <clears throat> the study did not require any visits for patients to do the spirometry. So we basically looked at the spirometry readings that were recorded in the medical records. So we didn't have enough data points to look at the trends, say where it peaked and you know, whether the effect was maintained. But certainly it's something that because this is an interim analysis, the final analysis, we are hoping at the 16 month time point, we're hoping that it will, there'll be more PPF even values where we can evaluate that in terms of the peak effects and you know, the maintenance of the effects. Thanks. And um, a question from a member of the audience. Um, did you observe any adverse effects such as liver injury um, on your data analysis? So again, for this, this is an interim analysis. And during the interim analysis time point, we, have, uh, we didn't have any uh, AEs reported during this time period. You know, but we will continue to collect any AEs and our pharmacovigilance team will be collecting any AEs from the, from the study and we'll be summarizing that as part of the final analysis. But we haven't noticed anything at, during the interim extraction time point. Much appreciated, thank you. And looking through the list of questions, um, I think that most of our, uh, I think that our questions are for Dr. Ganapathy have been answered. So um, thank you very much for sharing your very interesting work with us today. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Fisher. Um, uh, thank you again for um, your attention during our session. Hello, my name is Tony Fisher. Today, I'm going to talk to you about our project, CFTR Modulators in New Bacterial Acquisition, a registry-based analysis using data from the CFF patient registry. This work was done by Sachin Kumar Singh, a biostatistician in our department. These are our disclosures. As background, CFTR modulators have been a major breakthrough in the treatment of cystic fibrosis. We know that they improve lung function and other outcomes. And we know from the GOAL study that after Ivacaftor, Pseudomonas aeruginosa prevalence drops. This made us wonder whether the drop was due to a decreased acquisition of new Pseudomonas aeruginosa or eradication of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in previously infected patients. So our research question was whether CFTR modulators decrease new pathogen acquisition. And to address this question, we measured incident infections with Staphylococcus aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa using the CF patient registry, comparing patients receiving CFTR modulators versus controls. This is our study design. As our data source, we used the CFF patient registry between the years 2010 and 2017. We collected a baseline of two years on patients to establish baseline infections. We required at least one culture and the pathogens of interest were methicillin resistant Staph aureus, methicillin susceptible Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. After collecting the baseline period, we conducted a follow-up of two years and were required at least two cultures. And this was done to determine new pathogens that were not present in the baseline period. We examined two cohorts. The first was a one-to-one -one matched cohort of Ivacaftor recipients versus those patients not receiving CFTR modulators. The second comparison was Lumacaftor Ivacaftor recipients versus those not receiving modulators. This diagram shows the study population. There were 36,317 patients in the registry over these years. We excluded patients who did not have dates on some bacterial cultures, and we required a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. We then divided up this group into Ivacaftor, no CFTR modulator, and Lumacaftor Ivacaftor recipients. After excluding those who did not have enough baseline or follow-up cultures, 
These are the numbers that we had for each group. And then we performed a propensity score matching to get a one-to-one -one match of Ivacaftor versus control and Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor versus control. Our primary outcome was time to acquisition of any new methicillin resistant Staph aureus, methicillin susceptible Staph aureus, or Pseudomonas aeruginosa that was not present at baseline. These are the baseline characteristics of the patients. Male and female patients were distributed roughly equally between groups. On the left is no modulated group. In the middle is Ivacaftor. And on the right is Lumacaftor Ivacaftor. The, genotype, um, the, the genotypes were distributed unevenly between the groups as would be predicted by the indication for these medications. However, we did note that there were some individuals who had heterozygous F508 DEL and were recorded as Lumacaftor Ivacaftor recipients, which should not have been possible given the indication for the drug. We also saw homozygous F508 DEL patients recorded um, rarely in patients who were recorded as receiving Ivacaftor. Another difference between these groups was that the Lumacaftor Ivacaftor recipients tended to have a greater rate of prescription of inhaled antibiotics, such as inhaled tobramycin and astreonam and chronic use of macrolide antibiotics. A, a third difference between these groups was the age difference. Patients who did not receive CFTR modulators included those who were under the age of 12. These patients would not have been eligible for CFTR modulators when they were first introduced. So to try to address some of these differences between the groups, we did a propensity score matching. We created one-to-one -one matched cohorts for each drug, and we used the following parameters to help create these matched cohorts. Age, sex, F508 DEL um, status, insurance status, pancreatic insufficiency, the prescription of antibiotics, mucolytics, high-dose ibuprofen, and acid blockers. So this uh, table shows the results of propensity score matching. In the left-hand columns are our original samples, first with no modulator and then with Ivacaftor. And on the right is our propensity score matched sample. You'll see that, um, that the age, which was quite different between the groups, now is much more um, equal between the groups. However, there are some residual differences between them especially with the uh, prescription of inhaled tobramycin, um, which is higher in the no-modulator group. And accordingly, we found that the baseline infection rates were different between these groups. So the baseline rate of Pseudomonas aeruginosa was 64% in the no-modulator group versus 50% in the Ivacaftor group. MRSA and MSSA had roughly equal distributions between these groups. Our primary outcome was the time to acquisition of new pathogens. So we scored for the proportion that were free of new MRSA, MSSA, or Pseudomonas aeruginosa here in the y-axis. And on the x-axis is time in years. The blue group is the Ivacaftor recipient group. We saw that those who received Ivacaftor had prolonged time to acquisition of new pathogens compared to the no-modulator group. However, the effect size was rather small. We conclude that there is a statistically significant but minor reduction in this composite endpoint of pathogen acquisition. But what about each pathogen when examined individually? So the next graph shows the proportion free of new Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The Ivacaftor recipients had significantly longer periods of time without a new infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa compared to the no modulator control. The caveat here is that these patients had a lower prevalence of Pseudomonas aeruginosa at baseline, suggesting a lower biological susceptibility to this uh, infection with this organism. This is the proportion free of new methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Again, slightly prolonged period of, of, uh, in, of time free of infection for Ivacaftor versus no modulator. 
However, when we examined the proportion free of mu MSSA, we found that the IVACAFTA recipients cultured positive for MSSA earlier than the um, patients who um, did not receive a CFTR modulator. This shows an, an apparent increased risk of acquisition of new MSSA, a less virulent pathogen compared to the other two in patients receiving IVACAFTA. We next examined the uh, Lumacaftor IVACAFTA recipients. Again, we compared them to the no modulator um, recipients. This is the original sample of no modulator and Lumacaftor IVACAFTA. And uh, after propensity score matching, we saw that the age difference um, was, was, no longer, um, was no longer as large. In terms of baseline infections, the uh, um, the patients who received Lumacaftor Ivacaftor tended to have higher rates of MRSA compared to those who have uh, who were not receiving modulator therapies. The Pseudomonas and MSSA um, rates were similar between these two groups. In terms of the primary outcome, the um, the time to first new infection with MRSA, MSSA, or Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we saw no difference between these two groups. They acquired new pathogens at the same rate. And we conclude there was no change in the risk of pathogen acquisition. When we examined these pathogens individually, we saw the same trends as we did for Ivacaftor, except they were um, much less pronounced. This is the proportion free of new Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the Lumacaftor Ivacaftor slightly prolonged compared to the no modulator group. And the uh, proportion free of MSSA, the Lumacaftor Ivacaftor group acquired MSSA faster than the no modulator group. This table shows the, um, the final outcome, the hazard ratios for this composite endpoint of um, pathogen acquisition. And again, the pathogens defined in this study were MRSA, MSSA, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In the group receiving Ivacaftor, they had a reduced risk of acquiring new infections. When adjusting for, um, uh, for potential confounders, the hazard ratio was 0.82, a small but statistically significant reduction in acquisition of new pathogens. The Lumacaftor Ivacaftor group um, was not statistically different from the control. So, in conclusion, patients receiving Ivacaftor and Lumacaftor Ivacaftor both acquire new Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections. We did see that Ivacaftor was associated with a lower risk of acquiring these infections, and the largest protective effect for Ivacaftor was observed with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. However, because baseline data show lower Pseudomonas aeruginosa in these, in these patients, the difference might be uh, due to decreased biological susceptibility to Pseudomonas infections. We did see that Ivacaftor was associated with an increased risk of MSSA acquisition. We don't know exactly what this means, whether, whether the correction of CFTR results in, in acquisition of, of flora that are um, that are seen in normal hosts and less acquisition of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Lumacaftor Ivacaftor was not associated with a modified risk of new pathogen acquisition. There are some limitations of this study. It was a retrospective analysis. There are some inherent data limitations and there are residual confounding differences between the groups. There are differing start dates for the study cohorts based on the timing of drug approval. And pathogen acquisition could be related to genetic susceptibility to infection rather than CFTR correction. Our composite endpoint for pathogen acquisition might obscure protection against single organisms like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I'd like to acknowledge Sachin Kumar Singh, who performed the statistical analysis and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Patient Registry for providing us access to the data set. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Fisher, for sharing your very interesting work with us. We have a few questions from the audience. Um, first, do you think that other gram-negative rod organisms would act like pseudomonas? Um, do you have any thoughts on why better CFTR function may help off, uh, may help ward off certain organisms, but others for the ivacaftor in particular? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I. Uh, um... I, w I wish now that uh, we would have included that in our study design to look for um, a composite group of all gram negatives and a, and a composite group of all gram positives of, of interest, um, because it seems that, that there is a signal there with the pseudomonas. Um, uh, so that I would suspect that there may be some protection against that. Looking at um, some of our prospective um, uh, data collection, it seems like we're we're seeing perhaps less of some of these uh, other gram-negative organisms, um, uh, Acromobacter, Stenotrophomonas, Burkholderia, among uh, the patients who are now receiving the um, triple modulator therapy. So perhaps there is some protection there, but I don't have any data to prove that. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience. Does the MSSA acquisition have anything to do from uh, do with switching from MRSA to MSSA in the uh, airway microbiology? We need to uh, uh, look carefully at the data to see whether um, the patients who started out with MRSA ended up with MRSA. Um, my suspicion is that uh, people who have MRSA tend to hold on to MRSA, um, uh, but I, I don't. Uh, I don't have that, uh, the answer to that question with this data set yet. Um, uh, it is, you know, in looking, in looking through uh, at least our local data over the last decade, there's been a rise in MSSA. Uh, and, and it could be that, that what we're seeing is just a, a phenomenon of, of new clones of Staph aureus that are appearing in the general population, which happen to get cultured. Uh, here in the CF population. Thank you for that. Um, and a question which I know it was not the focus of your research per se, but um, did you observe any changes in inhaled or chronic antibiotics um, on, in the patients in the study? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, we, we scored for this as a, um, as a, a baseline exposure but we didn't uh, score for continued exposure throughout the, uh, uh, the time course. Um, that's a good idea. We should take a look at that. Um, I would think that based on the uh, uh, studies that have already been published on this, that people who are on effective CFTR modulators like Ivacaftor have fewer exacerbations and they probably receive fewer um, uh, courses of antibiotics to treat exacerbations. But as far as the chronic uh, antibiotics like inhaled tobramycin, I, I don't know that uh, answer yet. All good. Um, and I think that actually is the last of our questions that have been submitted. So thank you again, Dr. Fisher, for sharing your fascinating work with us today. Thank you very much. Well, Next up, we'll be hearing from Dr. Benjamin Kopp. Hi, I'm Ben Kopp. I'm going to talk about the rescue of CF phagocyte function with Alexacaptor, Tzcaptor, Ivacaptor, or ETI therapy today. I'm from Nationwide Children's Hospital. So these are my disclosures. These are the objectives for this talk. So we're mostly function, focusing on the uh, CFTR channel in, in monocyte-derived macrophages, or MDMs. So as we think about innate immune dysfunction in CF, uh, we're focused on macrophages as sentinel cells that regulate many processes in CF. And our overall knowledge of macrophage dysfunction in CF is very complex. Um, as shown in this, in this detailed diagram, um, there are a lot of issues mainly surrounding uh, CF macrophages as poor phagocytes and hyperinflammatory cells. Um, but not only do they have trouble with uh, uptake uh, through receptor-mediated phagocytosis, but also intracellular killing pathways that involve NOx assembly and defective autophagy or, or self-eating of pathogens and debris. Um, they have uh, hyperinflammatory signaling, uh, especially um, through the inflammasomes, um, but other pathways associated with ER stress, 
Um, and then some of these pathways are also due to altered amino metabolism as um, metabolites that contribute to anti-inflammatory effects can be altered as well as pro-inflammatory pathways. And finally, their uptake of other debris in, in, in the cells can be quite defective, including neutrophils and, and the extracellular traps from neutrophils or nets. But what we don't really understand is what are the indirect and direct uh, role of, for the CFTR channel in controlling these pathways? And what's going to happen um, in this era of uh, highly effective modular therapies if we manipulate CFTR channel function and expression? So to address these de deficiencies, we designed the CF immune study, uh, whereby we get uh, fresh samples, including uh, blood um, and sputum samples from um, people with CF pre and post modulator initiation over a year, and then correlate these outcomes with clinical data. Um, so for the following data, these will be um, monocyte derived macrophages from blood, um, since they are recruited throughout the body, including the lungs. These are the demographics of the participants in our study, uh, and we can note uh, fairly uh, moderate lung disease as well as a fair amount of, of antibiotic and hospitalization burden prior to uh, enrollment. So the first thing we'll look at is CFTR expression and localization. So this is confocal microscopy, whereby CFTR is in green, uh, lysosomal marker LAMP1 is in red, plasma membrane uh, marker WGA is in white and emerge at the end, and we have non-CF, CF, and then CF uh, macrophages post-ETI therapy. Um, and so you can clearly see that um, CFTR changes um, in, in its expression and it localizes to the plasma membrane um, post-ETI therapy. Um, this is during a, an inflammatory stimulus, but we have data with and without stimuli, um, as well as for uh, several other markers. And, and overall, our quantitative um, scoring of all these images shows that CFTR um, robustly uh, localizes the plasma membrane, but is um, co-localized also with several uh, intracellular trafficking markers, as well as degradative markers in a similar fashion to non-CF. When we look at other markers of, of CFTR expression, including a quantitative uh, intracellular flow cytometry assay, um, we see improvements, but not full normalization of CFTR expression. However, when looking at just uh, pure protein expression via uh, Western blot, um, both cytosolic and membrane fractionations of CFTR in, in these macrophages increases um, post-ETI therapy. So overall seeing very robust changes um, in CFTR expression within macrophages post-ETI. Um, we then set out to look at uh, macrophage CFTR function. Um, so what are the effects of changing expression? Uh, so to do this, we use an MQAE assay, um, which uses a chloride sensitive probe um, that um, expresses uh, fluorescence when the channel is active and effluxing chloride out. Um, so you can get a time dependent change in chloride efflux. And so you end up getting tracings that look similar to the using chamber assays that are shown with epithelial cells, whereby you stimulate with forskolin and other agonists. Um, you can get a, a signal of, of CFTR flux, um, and then you inhibit and quench the signal. Here, just showing you some representative tracings from, from prior studies with, with knockout models. And importantly, when you first set up these assays, we used um, um, monocytes from the same individuals um, and, and set a pair of them that we um, did not give any further ETI therapy during culture to um, macrophages. Um, as well as those that received um, ex vivo ETI supplementation, um, similar to people that would be receiving ETI daily. And so over this five-day um, period where monocytes are derived into macrophages in ex vivo culture, um, you can see that there's a marked difference in the CFTR channel function between those who continue to receive ETI and those who had only received it um, clinically in vivo. Um, so this suggests that um, you know, monocytes and macrophages will need to be um, have continued presence of ETI to maintain any changes in CFTR channel function. So here I'm showing you the individual results for, for monocytes from individuals um, participants. Um, again, um, pre and post ETI uh, for monocytes and here for macrophages. And you can notice that we had very limited changes in CFTR channel function for monocytes as compared to much more robust um, changes for macrophages that continue to receive um, ex vivo ETI therapy. And overall, these were varied between individuals. Um, you see one individual here um, who had nice robust monocyte responses, but most of them did not. Whereas more consistent increases were shown in the macrophages, but again, varied from individual to individual, um, which is a theme we'll come back to in, in all these studies that we saw quite varied individual responses. But um, the differences in monocyte and macrophage responses suggest either um, 
differences in sensitivity or, or prolapse, um, less exposure to these circulating myocytes um, in vivo. We also have patch gland data, which I'm happy to talk about, but won't shell today. Um, we then wanted to see what's the impact of changes in CFTR on clinical correlations. Um, so here I'm showing you sweat chlorides for the cohort pre and post ETI, where you see nice market reductions with many of these people having levels below our clinical diagnostic threshold of 60 millimoles per liter um, post ETI. Here we're showing you changes in longitudinally over one year on the x-axis and FEV1 is a marker of lung function. And you can see a nice steady increase over the first six months. However, then there's a significant decrease in leveling off, um, suggesting that some of these changes um, are not uh, fully preserved over time. And then importantly, when we try to correlate um, each individual's post ETI sweat chloride with their change in lung function, we did not see any correlation at all. Um, so this was not a robust uh, predictive marker of clinical responses. Interestingly though, when we looked at changes in macrophage CFTR function um, post ETI compared to their um, changes in sweat or the sweat chloride levels post DTI, and you can see there's a nice um, negative correlation whereby those with the greatest increases in CFTR channel function and macrophages had the lowest sweat chlorides. And then further, we saw um, significant correlations between changes in macrophage CFTR function, again on the x-axis, and changes in both FEV1 and BMI. So this suggests that uh, overall uh, responses in the immune cells were much um, better uh, clinical indicators of, of the responses between these individuals because you know, we saw varied responses amongst the individuals. Um, and finally, I'm just going to touch briefly on some of our assays looking at the phagocytic properties in response to um, CFTR modulation. Um, so the first thing we did was looked at aphrocytosis because as we mentioned, this is important for clearance of debris as well as the, the pro-inflammatory properties of apoptotic neutrophils in the airways. And here you can see um, both the quantitative scoring and um, some representative fluorescent images where these, these dead neutrophils express a CF CFSE fluorescent signal. Um, and we can see nice um, significant increase post ETI, but not quite to the level um, that we see overall um, when scoring all these images for non-CF. We verified this with scanning EM, where again, you can see kind of nice uptake of these dense apoptotic neutrophils um, post ETI therapy. Um, akin to what we see in non-CF. When we look at bacterial phagocytosis, however, we saw a little bit varied um, results here. Um, I'm showing you uh, non-CF uh, over here on the left, uptake of Burkholderia sinusopatia, as well as CF. Um, and you can see that uh, we actually had significant increases in both non-CF and CF post ETI, but the, the CF macrophages remain much lower than non-CF. Um, there's actually, again, varied responses between the individuals. So some of these still having about half the levels of, of non-CF. And this is important, I think, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, when we look at um, our prior studies of, of CFTR knockout models, um, where um, just using a CFTR knockout um, here on the right uh, did not increase uh, phagocytosis. When we look at uh, bacterial killing, um, we see similar overall results where we see significant increases in clinical isolates of Urcularia stensipatia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Um, however, there's again varied responses uh, between these individuals with um, still levels above non CF for Burkholderia and Pseudomonas, whereas uh, the staph clearance levels approach those of non CF. Um, and again, in our prior CFTR knockout models, we saw that this was directly dependent on CFTR as there were increases in bacterial load for both Burkholderia and Pseudomonas just by simply knocking out CFTR. So it appears that um, ETI therapy is able to improve aspects of phagocytosis and killing, but not normalize them completely. So why is this happening? So one of our proposed mechanisms involves an imbalance of, of the GTPA signaling uh, molecules res responsible for phagocytosis and aphrocytosis. Um, and this is because prior studies that we've done looking at a whole blood RNA-seq from older CFTR modulators, such as Lumicaptor, Ivacaptor, have shown that uh, the most robust signals and, and changes in pathways for people with good clinical responses to these older modulators occurred in areas such as row A signaling, um, actin size skeleton signaling and other factors related to these, this imbalance of um, markers needed for uptake of, of bacteria and other debris. Um, so we looked at expression um, 
view QRT-PCR of several of these uh, controlling factors um, here showing you a representative schematic of how they're involved in these processes. Um, so this is row A, RAC1, and CDC42, all three critical factors in these um, pathways. And you can see that actually post ETI on these FAR2 columns um, in response to either baseline or with infection with Burkholderia sinusopatia, um, we actually see kind of a hyper expression um, of all three factors and normalization of deficits that we saw prior um, to ETI therapy. Um, we've also done functional assays that confirm that there are changing levels of the activity of these markers here, CDC42 and here, row A, um, whereas either at baseline or in response to a, a, a so the stimulus um, FMLP, um, we see improvements, but not normalization in, in areas such as CDC42. And if we take this together with some other um, SEM images that we've done during phagocytosis experiments, um, it, you know, it really suggests to us that there are, are issues still ongoing with the, the macrophage site skeleton. Um, so here we've pseudocolored the macrophages purple, and bacteria are pseudocolored red. Um, and you can see that um, Post ETI therapy, we're seeing changes in, in the cytoskeleton. We're seeing bacteria that look like they're being actively phagocytosed um, and you know, in terms of production of some extracellular traps from the macrophages. But the overall arrangement is, is quite disorganized um, that we see. So well, this is an exciting area for us to continue to follow up. So in summary, we think CFTR modulation is directly impacting innate immune function and is importantly clinically clinically correlated with outcomes. So we may be able to you know, phenotype people moving forward, but overall there remains a kind of a complex web that we need to um, undertake to fully understand how CFTR modulators impact any immune function. So moving forward, uh, we really wanna focus on how CFTR modulators can impact not only the, the factors from the bone marrow, but also from, from the airway um, and the crosstalk between innate and adaptive immune cells and how they uh, respond to CFTR modulation. So I'd like to thank our collaborators, um, my lab, especially Shuzong, and our funding sources. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you very much for sharing your fascinating work with us, Dr. Kopp. Um, I have a few questions from the audience that I wanted to share with you. Um, the first question I wanted to ask was whether you might be able to comment on um, whether the change in macrophage function could actually explain the um, you know, what the ability of certain patients on ETI to overcome certain pathogen classes um, or organisms. I'm curious to know whether this is something that you've thought about? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, before I answer that, I just want to give a, a quick shout out to um, Shuzong Zhang from my lab who was supposed to present this talk, but had to return uh, back home to China to take care of some family members. So I, I hope he's still able to watch and he was going to present this great work. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it certainly could be one of the factors involved. I, I mean, our experimental data would, would point to that it certainly plays a role um, for some of the differential regulation of bacteria. And I think from what we know from non-modulator studies, um, you know, it, macrophages have a very important role um, in, in controlling certain pathogens. Um, I think certainly they're not going to be the only factor involved as, we, as we've seen, you know, the airway epithelium, the mucus component, the other um, innate and adaptive immune cells are all going to be critical factors in that. And so as we gain more information about all those components together, um, hopefully we can figure things out a little bit more clearly. But I think it speaks to the role of, you know, potentially targeting certain aspects, you know, of, of cells, whether we can, you know, deliver molecules inside of macrophages to better, um, you know, work in synergy with the modulators. Thank you. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, would you be able to comment on the reason for biologic variability in the data? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and I think, you know, as you've seen throughout all these presentations, there's, there's certainly some variability. And we know CF is not a, a one-stop shop. Um, we've known for, throughout time you can have siblings with, with variability. So I think there, there's potentially some, you know, other... Um, genetic or epigenetic phenomenon happening here that, that may play a role. Um, certainly there can be real life factors um, that may be part of things in terms of, you know, stressors. Um, you know, Tony did a nice job of controlling for some of those things in his studies, um, but it, it's, it's hard to say for sure. We, we are looking at, um, you know, hopefully some comprehensive sequencing of this cohort as well. Um, and we have some other data I didn't present today on other ion channels that are um, being altered at the same time.
Neat, thank you. Um, another question, uh, would you be able to um, clarify what you would have done with the hair that you collected during your study? Oh, sure. Yeah, we look at um, nicotine for uh, tobacco exposure. Um, so we have a lot of interest in, in how that affects early outcomes. And so um, we're still collecting those. I haven't been able to um, analyze that side of, of this subset yet, um, but we hope to in, in the future. Um, but we've seen that that can affect a lot of the pro-inflammatory cascade if they have ongoing tobacco exposure. Um, and at least in Ohio, in our region, there's, there's a high um, amount of that that still goes on. Um, you can also look at stress um, you know, using cortisol and things. So, so we hope to be adding that on um, here soon to our studies. Thanks. And um, another question from the audience. Um, could you comment on the potential mechanisms of bacterial killing? Yeah, so I think um, there, there, there are several aspects to this um, and you know, data that I'm not showing. Um, we know that uh, um, the ETI is impacting a couple pathways that we think are dependent on, on proper CFTR function. So those include um, the proper assembly of the, the NOx complex that produces reactive oxygen species. Um, and then those are essential for, for triggering autophagy, which is kind of self-eating of bacteria and, and debris. Um, so both of those pathways seem to improve, um, you know, post-modulation. Um, we'd like to look at some detailed studies looking at some of the receptor changes. We haven't done that quite yet, um, but that's planned in the future as well um, in terms of other um, aspects of the phagocytosis. And then, like I mentioned, I think the, the actin side of skeleton is going to be really important to, to all of this as well. Fantastic. And um, I guess uh, my, my own question, have you studied the effect of ETI or sorry, um, have you studied the effect of other CFTR modulators on macrophage function? Yeah, yeah. So we, we have a couple of papers out about those. So, um, you know, things like Lumacaptor, Ivacaptor or Tizacaptor, Ivacaptor really had negligible impact on, on macrophage function um, in, in our studies in the past. Um, so we don't see near the significant improvement and changes in CFTR and the CFTR dependent aspects of it um, that we showed in this study. Um, Ivacaptor itself and people with Ivacaptor sensitive um, variants um, do have a, a pretty good response, um, you know, similar to what we've seen here, although I think this is a little bit more robust than what we saw in the past. Um, and I think there's some other interesting things where we saw um, older modulators for those homozygous for F508 um, actually had some negative impacts on phagocytosis, um, which we did not see for this triple combination here. Um, there's always some questions out there about how these small molecules interact in the cells. Um, and, you know, there's some interesting data in immune cells and epithelial cells about how some of the older ones could negatively interact, um, but we did not see that here. Sorry, I was muted there for a moment. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Um, what do you think is the reason that um, even if you were to remove macrophages from the context of the patient and then restore CFTR function, um, where it, it does not seem to fully restore them to non-CF functionality. Um, could this be due to incomplete CFTR rescue or other causes? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's likely probably a combination of not full CFTR restoration. You know, as we've seen um, with the, the, you know, heterozygous or, or I'm sorry, the, the carrier status, you know, these large studies that have shown that maybe people with just a single copy of a CFTR variant may have some overall changes in their clinical health. I think there's probably a threshold of CFTR restoration that's important. Um, I think there's also, you know, the, the possibility of that, you know, milieu that's going on in the body and in the lungs is, is negatively reprogramming things that, you know, aren't fully restored. So. Thanks. Um, and uh, another question, um, is the function of peripheral monocytes or macrophages also improved by modulators? Yeah, so we haven't studied monocytes themselves as much um, in, as we have the, the MDMs. Um, like I said, there's, there's variable responses within the monocytes and we're having some ongoing work with that. Um, I was surprised, you know, these were fresh isolations when we looked at the monocytes, we took them from the patients, they had their dose in the morning. Um, and I was surprised not to see as, as robust changes in there, but we do see aspects of the, the monocyte 
um, function that seems to be improved as well. Um, but that's gonna be a really important question since those are recruited throughout the body. So. Thank you. And um, looking through the list of questions, I think that you have answered um, every single one. So uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Kopp, for sharing your fascinating work with us. Thank you, Julian. Um, last but most certainly not least, we will be hearing from Grace Cho about her research. Hi, uh, this is Grace. Um, I'm a PhD candidate, comes from CCHMC and the UC, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. It is a great pleasure to present our recent work on predicting declines in the lung function with the US CF registry by considering the impact of initiating highly effective uh, modulator therapy. And the following relationship exists related to this presentation. Our work is supported by CF Foundation Research and the Development Program, and we have no conflicts of interest to report. Um, okay, so I will give you a brief introduction here, uh, but for better presentation experience, I'm going to uh, hide the video. I hope that is okay. So HEMT is short for highly effective modulator therapy, and it continues to uh, improve the lung function trends in nearly 90% of people living with CF in US. And HEMT could be elexacopter, tetacopter, or avicopter. And in this study, uh, we will focus on avicopter. And the avicopter can be used in patients over four months old, uh, with GFR1D mutation in CF gene. Um, as a means to evaluate lung function, we take FAV1% predicted as the primary marker. Hereafter, I will call it FEV1. And in addition, we take FAV1 indicated exacerbation score, which is named as FILES. To monitor the potential pulmonary exacerbation, the rationale for its definition is shown on the left. So it depends on the value of baseline FAV1 in prior year, a relative drop of 10% uh, or 5% or more in FAV1 will be marked as a false event. Also, a rule of 28 days indicating that uh, if an encounter is marked as false event, then following encounters occurred within 28 days won't be marked for anything. Since the effectiveness of avicopter has been shown, we still want to find solutions to following questions. How robust are predictions of lung function in post HEMT era? And how accurate are identifications of false events we can provide in order to answer those, we came up with a published, uh, with a published uh, prediction model on FAV1 rapid decline and adapt its target function to predict the probability of files occurrence. The data we use is from USCF Foundation patient registry and trajectories of FAV1 for three random profiles show the great variability between and within patients. The bump showing here in the smoothing curve is possibly an overall boost from avicopter initiation. And the shift dots um, are used to detect the occurrence of files. There are two reasons to uh, induce the missing files. Uh, it might be due to missing baseline MPV1 or it falls into 28 days rule. And the frequency of files is dropped from 27 to 22. Uh, it might be a good sign of improvement in lung function after the initiation. And the average baseline age is dropped, uh, sorry, is around 22 years old with a range of uh, 618 to 68, 75 years old. And the average duration of the follow-up is around 14 years uh, with a range of one to 16 years. 
Our study cohort consists of 867 individuals who are at risk of rapid decline by meeting inclusion criteria. Uh, for instance, there are uh, uh, patients with g 5 one d mutation uh, who ever started diabetic after from 2012, and they are aged over 60 years old during the observed period 2003 to 2018. And also we required the least number of observations before and after of, uh, initiation, um, that is for the model estimation accuracy purpose. Uh, observation are censored at long transplantation, death, or end of observed period. And for validation purpose, given our g 5 d cohort, we randomly select 80% of patients as training cohort and the remaining as testing cohort. And to further evaluate, uh, to further evaluate the, the forecasting performance, uh, we mask all observations in the last six months for every patient. Here I list all covariates we are using in the model. Uh, red colors, those red colors uh, represent derived variables uh, from our site. And we aim to depict uh, age-related lung function decline in the model. By considering the impact of avicopter, we add a change point in the model to modify the slope between pre avicopter and post avicopter So we have set up several models and select the optimal one by model selection criteria. Uh, this optimal model can capture uh, heterogeneous nature of FEV1 declines and uh, is capable to detect potential files in events. So I will show you individual predictions as well as predictive performance metrics shortly. And the change point is shown to be significant and it modifies the slope from 2176 to 4169. Um, and meanwhile, we also plot the prediction at the population level, a dramatic improvement after initiation from a statistical side is evident. So all these results corroborate the positive impact of initiating HEMP, which was shown in many previous studies. Now let's take a look at individual dynamic predictions with 95% confidence intervals. The age shown here is the age uh, when people take the AVIC after. So we use all the dots in blue area to train the model uh, with sky blue for pre avic after and blue for post avic after. And the forecast the next six months in orange area. And the plots on the right are corresponding predicted probabilities of files in events. We plot the pink dots for successful identifications while black dots for failures. The failure means that our method does not detect a files uh, occurrence or vice versa. Uh, no method is 100% accurate. So these are normal and acceptable. Our method is not only used to forecast the observations for existing patients, but also can be used to predict the whole trajectories for new patients as shown here. The plot shows impressive predictive performance. To better understand the overall predictive performance, we summarize the metrics by initiation uh, status in this table. And for the purpose of this work, I highlight the values in the post avic after period and they show reasonable predictive performance. To check the performance for files classification, we plot ROC curves. Uh, if you are not familiar with this plot, please refer to the cute hand drawing one on the right. Basically, the larger area under the curve indicates the better classification. The false classification in post avicopter period is outstanding. The accuracy and the precession uh, rates are shown in this table. Uh, to help clinicians to predict and prevent false exacerbation event, 
accuracy is more important. Besides mean analysis, we implement some sensitivity analysis as well. For example, we define a new baseline by the idea of stable encounter. And also uh, we use a continuous um, covariate uh, birth year to replace the original categorical uh, covariate, which is called birth cohort. And also we repeat resampling cross-validation for five times to verify previous one-time random cross-validation. And none of those results violate our current conclusions. So in the future work, we might assign a new distribution for measurement error to see if there are any improvements in predictions. And we will investigate other highly effective modulators or their combinations to release our current limitation. Uh, and most importantly, we'd like to implement an interactive online tool for more clinicians to be, ava to be available to track FEV1 trajectories and predict the files exacerbation events for their CF patients. So I would like to give all the thanks to co-authors in this project and uh, NACFC organizers and the CFFPR uh, committee. And uh, also our work is regarded as an extension to a published paper by Dr. Sesniak and her co colleagues in 2012. And that is all I have for today. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Cho, for sharing your very interesting work with us today. Um, I'm going to start off with a question. Do you think it's plausible that your prediction, the, the prediction model would also work well for um, other um, registries from other parts of the world? Um, I think so, but it also depends on the, for other countries, maybe we need to involve some other covariates to adjust for the performance. But I think for the basic prediction performance, uh, it should work given the, uh, the nature of FEV1. Right on, thank you. And um, I um, obviously I know an immense amount of work would have gone into a study like this. Um, in terms of the mm -hmm work that you had alluded to in the future for other modulators, um, including ETI, is this something that we can look forward to like in the foreseeable future as well? Yes, yes, I think so. Because I also said uh, my, my current project have the limitation on the avicapter only, but I'm looking forward to involve the triple modulator. Yeah, later in the, in the modeling and to see how it works well for, for that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Thank and you. looking through the list of questions, um, I don't see any um, other submitted questions at this time. So um, thank you again for um, sharing your excellent research with us today. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to uh, thank the all of the speakers today for um, sharing their work with us. I'd like to share um, thank the organizers as well as the audience uh, for um, their um, attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.